Welcome to this episode. I'm so pleased to be here with Garima Tolani today. She is a partner account manager at Salesforce in London. She's been working at Salesforce for seven years and counting, and she is a really good girlfriend of mine. So I actually met Garima from our time volunteering together at Girls in Tech, which is a nonprofit. And we met at Girls in Tech in San Francisco, and we both lived there many years ago. And we were uh, advisory board members there as well. So we volunteered extensively for Girls in Tech. So I'm so pleased to have her today as a guest so we could talk about what it means to be a partner account manager, what it means to volunteer for Girls in Tech so much, and of course, Grima's time living in London. So Grima, I'd love to have you introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks for having me. I'm Grima. As Jess mentioned, I was living and working in San Francisco, started my career in tech there, and always had this dream of wanting to experience life abroad and had romanticized Europe at the time and woke up one morning realizing that there's really nothing getting in my way except for me. And then eventually as I learned my manager who, when I approached to say I would, wanted to transfer to Europe, said that it probably wasn't going to be likely anytime soon. And I was working as an implementation consultant at Salesforce at the time supporting our customers in their transformation journey, helping them really embrace the cloud. And after a few months of having this realization and, and this conversation, there ended up being an opening on the EMEA team for the same practice that I was supporting in the US. And they needed somebody to come and help them expand that team. So I was recruited to come out and I'd never been anywhere in Europe before, but had the option of going to any major city so I picked London. I thought there would be no language barrier and technically there isn't, but if you've been to London as an American, there definitely is. Um, a language, are you like here, a culture shock, a language barrier? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few words that I would tell my fellow Americans not to say at the office because yes. they have a very different and inappropriate meaning here. So that was about five years ago when I came out here as a senior consultant, helping some of our more strategic customers transform on that journey. And as a result of that, got um, started getting incremental exposure to our partner ecosystem, right? Partners who are helping us drive success in these accounts and then winning the services revenue off the back of that. Um, and that seemed like a really attractive role at the time, it involved a lot of travel, which I was very into. I ended up switching from being customer facing to supporting our partner ecosystem, did an alliances enablement role about three years ago. And since then, I've become a partner account manager, looking after a handful of our hyper growth, high potential accounts, consulting partners in the UK, and effectively helping them make more money with Salesforce. And when you talk about partners, is it literally one person or is it a team of people as well? And when I say partner, a consulting um, firm. So a partner is a company. It could be, you know, I've got partners in my portfolio where they're a team of maybe 10 only focusing on, for example, a commerce cloud or a revenue cloud, and that's all that they do, or maybe they only do service for a particular industry. And then I've got some names that you've probably heard that have a more of a global footprint, and they might be operating across four or five different industries and, and working on different products. And it could be that Salesforce isn't the only technology house that they support. Um, maybe they're right. doing Microsoft and some others as well. Right. So okay. it really so varies. And there are multiple people then that you interface with from the same partner then? Yeah, I would say it's, it's the same two to three. It's usually at the, the exec level. So for some of the smaller, um, more boutique companies, I'm talking to CEOs, COOs on maybe a bi-monthly basis. And then typically as this partners mature, they will hire someone that's dedicated to maintaining alliances um, and or ideally they have a salesperson, right? So the conversations that we're having are around what are your plans to grow your business with Salesforce? And there's people that whose jobs are dedicated to answering that question. So do you get to pick the accounts that you have or how do, do they get assigned? We have a running list of accounts that we think will help us drive success. As for how the portfolio is divided, I think we, we aim to have a good balance of some of our more mature partners and then some of our, our new more boutique ones that are maybe just getting started on their Salesforce journey. And every year when we're doing our account mapping, we do look at 
where did we end up with each partner and we might promote them within the team. They're getting more resources effectively from Salesforce because we see even more potential in them or they're staying with us and then we're going to continue to nurture them. Or we might see that maybe they need to go back to another team where we have more of a back to basics conversation with them. Wow. So in a nutshell, yes, we have some control over who we look after. Yeah. Oh my gosh. And do they, are they uh, spanning all different types of industries for you? Or do you have like niches among your own team members? Exactly. It's all across the customer 360 uh, within Salesforce and spanning all industries. And Salesforce is shifting more and more. We made that shift to align our teams to an industry model and see how we develop more turnkey solutions for specific use cases within a particular subsector of an industry. And we're encouraging our partners to follow that model as well. So yeah, all 23 of my partners uh, work across different business segments in the UK, across quite a few different industries. Some of the stuff that I see about partner accounts, they have quotas. What does that mean? When like Mm -hmm. roles, they like, oh, this is like a quota carrying role. Yes, I'm in one of those roles right now. And the idea is that our sales teams have a growth target, right? We want to close i'm just going to use some numbers here uh, 100 million in revenue for this fiscal year right for a particular region my objective as a partner account manager is to have my partner support a portion of that 100 million right so my target could be that of that 100 million that we want to achieve 70 million of that we should be doing it with partners ideally it would be 100 million right and it's effectively saying that the salesperson or the sales teams that are driving that hundred million, they should say that I drove a certain percentage of this with the support of partners. So mm-hmm. we've got what we call an attach rate metric, right? And with that attach rate, we have a number that we're working towards where our partners should be helping us close this amount of business. Do you find that metric is, is fair or put another way, do you ever find yourself in a situation where partners refuse to carry on using Salesforce because of a product issue, for example, that you have no control over? How do you handle that? But most of the people that I, I talk to, right, they've got their own metrics, right? And that's driving services revenue with Salesforce. So they're, by the nature of their role, incent to engage more with our sales teams. And the more that licensed sales that they help us close, the services revenue off the back of that is is their incentive. I think. The challenge that I come across is that um, there's two main ones, right? Partners will, they're told about the opportunity that, you know, they will receive if they become a Salesforce partner. But the expectation as a result of that is that Salesforce will proactively give them business. And the expectation of our sales teams is that partners will be giving us leads, and it turns into that Spider-Man pointing at each other <laughs> meme of you give us business, you give us business. <laughs> and I think for partners that are are just starting up that maybe aren't so well known, I have to coach them around uh, the fact that we need to build trust with our sales teams, and the way that we do that is by highlighting to them, you know, what value we bring to the table, what footprint we have in a certain market, and how we can unlock ACD together. Um, And ideally it is bringing them a bit of business. And then ultimately they then become the go-to partner for that sales team, right? And then the sales team actually starts to bring them in early into the sales cycle and we drive that success together. So um, expectations, as you might imagine, it can be a challenge every now and then. Uh, The second one is that I think this is very typical in big organizations, right? There might be sales teams that aren't really aware of the value that partners can drive for us. I'm a partner champion, so I know the value that they can bring, but a salesperson might see a partner as a blocker or a threat or a competition or something that's going to slow them down from from closing the deal, when in fact, it's quite the opposite. A big part of the challenge is, is just that constant awareness and enablement of why our AEs, account execs, should be working with partners that partners are actually an extension of our team. Yeah. Um, and we should be treating them as our customers. Um, and yeah, there's so much that business that our partners have actually brought to us that our sales team wouldn't have without our partners. So um, those are two of the, the 
sticky situations. So how do you tackle that? Do you talk to the sales team directly or how do you mediate what you just said? I think I think just given the sheer volume of people in the organization, I try and think about keeping at the top of mind of the conversation, what value can partners drive, right? And then I think address the conversation by answering the question, what's in it for me? So I don't, I don't want, I don't want my metrics to drive the conversation. I don't want the partner wanting implementation bits to drive the conversation. It's, we all want customer success. We all want to sell more stuff. How do we do that together? So I approach it, I'm not trying to boil the ocean here and go and spread the message to the masses. Every now and then there's an opportunity at scale to make the AEs more aware of the support that we have through the partner network. But usually it's talking to the partners, helping them sharpen their messaging and saying that if Salesforce AEs weren't in the picture to give you business, how would you be addressing the market? And what are your demand generation plans? And who are the customers you're going after? Because I assure you, if you start doing all that, I'm going to get a message from a salesperson saying, hey, I heard about this partner working with all my customers. I need to talk to them. So it's taking that route and having conversations at an account level. Because if there's an opportunity, you know, that we potentially see, I think lots of ears are going to perk up and people are going to be very motivated to speak to a partner that could help them out. Yeah, got it. Well, yeah, it's yeah. definitely sound, a very relationship heavy role for sure. Yeah. yeah. What is, do you have other team members on, on your team that do what you do? What is your relationship to them? Is there any type of sort of collaboration with them? And what does that mean? Because everybody mm-hmm. has their own partners. Yeah, we're trying to be a bit better at sharing best practices, but I work as a team of four and between us, including my manager, which makes five, we look after a hundred accounts total. And sometimes it does get tricky because a lot of our, especially our big strategic customers, you'll often see a multi-partner landscape across a fortune 100 company. So the lots of partners in the mix, oftentimes some of these customers will put out Uh, an RFP that multiple partners want to respond to and therefore you do get into a situation where you know only one there's only room for one partner at the most two to be acknowledged as helping us um, influence this deal and it may be one of my partners and I want their name to be attached to this deal and this win um, but another partner account manager right might have their partner um, facing off and yeah we usually start by understanding what role our partner is playing respectively and how they're driving value. Ultimately, it ends up being the AE's call of, of what they say and they have to approve. Okay. Um, and sometimes we do split, sometimes we do split the credit. Yeah, in, in a way it is because our partners often compete against each other and the nature of how we're incentivized, it doesn't foster a ton of collaboration, but I think there's, the team is recognizing that there's still value to be gained by us getting together sharing best practices and because we all tend to be in the same situation with maybe folks outside of alliances right we might be having the same conversations with the sales teams or realizing that we're all having the same issue how do we approach that at a systematic level got it what is the time when you went to your manager for help i have a good example here one of the partners that i manage i've been in this role for about a year now I remember from my initial call with them that we were not the loves of each other's lives. I think they they found my approach to be a bit direct American and they operate, this partner operates quite differently from the rest in the sense that they, um, they're big influencers in, in some of our top accounts, but they're not just pushing a Salesforce message. They're a bit more agnostic. Um, they're also a lot more expensive. And if you compare that with some of the other partners who live and breathe Salesforce and are very proactive and hungry and maybe a bit more aggressive in their approach to interact with our teams, there's a stark difference between how this particular partner operates and, and how the rest operate. And I think this, a sticking point that has that we've been dealing with since day one is that I'm a commissionable employee. The people that I support, the sales teams, are also working against quarterly targets and they've got numbers to hit by a certain date. And this partner's point of view is that we get that, but that's not really conducive to customer success. And some of the customers we're working with 
operate on like multi-year cycles and your sales teams are too aggressive and wanting to get a deal over the line by this date. So their operating model had a, a bit of friction with our sales team. So to answer your question, right, I, I think maybe six months ago received an email from this partner where they said their objective was to be plugged into multiple sales teams and have recurring cadences with them. Um, and that was a challenge because the, the stance they're taking, right, is that we're quite agnostic. We don't really work um, along the same timelines as your sales team does. So as their PAM, there's lots of things that we need to, in a way, fix before we get them in that position of engaging and interlocking with the sales teams. And part of my job, even though I get incentivized on the success of my partners, is to, to be their coach. And a lot of times that means taking an idea, right? Providing my feedback, which can be quite constructive and pushing back a bit and saying that we're not ready for this yet, or I'm not ready, I'm not going to do this until we're in this position because I've seen these conversations go sideways and I've got 23 partners to think about. And if I burn a bridge by putting you forward at the wrong time, this person isn't going to listen to me the other 22 times I might want to talk to them. I, I it was a delicate situation and of course I see the potential in the partner, but we need to have a big mindset shift, right? And meet in the middle somehow. They're not wrong, right? But our sales teams are, are acting the way they are for reasons. We need to work on our approach there. So I did go to my manager to understand how we're going to best handle this because no one likes hearing no. And I want to not discourage them and have them say, okay, forget this. We're going to go and become a Microsoft shop either. This is something that I, I should have seen coming, but I didn't. But my boss suggested that uh, this partner and I just go and have dinner together <laughs> and get to know each other. Yeah. Because yeah, it, as you can imagine, 23 partners, we're not getting a lot of one-to-one -one time because it's a, quite an extensive portfolio. And we did have dinner. And I think through us getting to know each other a bit better and seeing each other as not just transactional entities here to do our job, but as two humans right, and learn more about each other. I think that's really what it took to unlock a better partnership, a stronger partnership. And I think it also, you know, we were able to establish trust where I could be a bit more candid with my feedback around, this is your USP and it's great, but this is how it's resonating with our sales teams. And here's how we need to do a better job so that we can propel your brand further into Salesforce, which is what we all want. So yeah, ha having dinner, that was not the only solution, but yeah. What does it take to be a good partner account manager? And for folks wanting to recruit into this role, what advice would you give them? There's a lot of numbers that we look at as part of the job, but I think it's very easy to become very transactional with the partners. And I think I went into this job maybe not being supportive enough. One of my partners recently met with our CEO for the UK and she said something to them at the end, which is incredible. She said, there's no one else like you Love that. to them. And of course, and yeah, who wouldn't want to hear that, right? Um, you're special. And then I, I ended that call and I thought, how often, right, do I actually look up, look at how far we've come, how hard these partners are trying and actually say, hey, you're doing a great job. I think it a lot. And, and I know that I'm a partner champion. Of course, I'm in an alliance, this role where quite literally my partner's success is my success. But yeah, just feeding that back to the partners a little bit more. Right. And, and not just taking the work that they do because that's what they get paid on for granted. But yeah, making more of an effort to make them feel seen and, and valued and hurt. I think if I were to restart this role, I would definitely spend a lot more time listening and understand their business rather than saying, this is what Salesforce is doing. And you go and, and, and deal with that and then come back to me with an idea. It's, it's hey, what are you trying to accomplish what does good look like for you? So keeping their goals top of mind from the very beginning, listening more. I think I was also a bit of a hard ass. I said no a lot to my partners. I still do. <laughs> but I think, yeah, I think as a new pan, the temptation is to, to want it to be perfect, right? Because again, I know that I want them to succeed, but maybe what they're getting back is 
not good enough. So it's finding that balance of, hey, this is great so far. I think we can take it one step further. And yeah, that blend of coaching, but also encouragement and definitely 100% appreciation, right? They are a customer of ours. And I, I think sometimes we, we don't always treat them that way, myself included. So listening skills, relationship skills, I oftentimes get stuck between the partner and a salesperson and um, get it from both sides. So yeah, having that balance of playing back what the partner is feeling to the salesperson and giving them the constructive feedback from sales and retaining that balance is key to, I think, a relationship management role. And I think also as someone looking after 23 accounts, it's very easy to be reactive, right? And be driven by emails yeah. of, I need this or I need that. I would say leverage the, the tools that you have to set up a really clever dashboard that gives you a, a future view Ooh, like and that. to understand, yeah, to understand metrics that should be helping you drive conversations. So you can come to meetings prepared and there is an element of ruthless prioritization to the job. We have a target to hit. I can't be supporting all of my partners at the same level. So at some point, someone's going to get more attention if that takes away from another partner. And sometimes that's fine, but we just yeah. have to be, you just have to make sure that the strategy you're applying behind that prioritization has data behind it. Yeah, I love that. The second thing of what you just said reminds me of what part of, and I know we actually talked about this in person is our judgment and how important it is for us to be recognized for having good judgment sometimes because yeah. we forget because it's almost like our react or not reactive, our default reaction and we go with it because we have this judgment, but it's mm -hmm. good. It's good judgment. And then the first part of what you said really resonates because I think it takes a very intentional flip in our own mindset to say, hey, like for myself, I'll speak to, I teach a lot of classes. So that is my role as the instructor. I have this mm -hmm. idea and I've been doing it. So I know I'm taking most of the airtime. I'm asking questions and I treat my audience as students, but to also be open to and aware that actually my students should also be telling me how they want to be taught right like I should not yeah. be going like one way down towards them and and how you know what other roles do they play for me not only as students but perhaps like curriculum builders right like they say hey I don't want to do this Q&A section right now then I have to honor mm -hmm. like okay this is what I had in my mind is, is scrapped and I need to pivot and let me be open to some other roles that these people are playing for me Definitely. What's the kind of your trajectory for a normal PAM to be like? Is it to be like senior PAM? And then eventually, what do you do after senior PAM? Mm -hmm. Yes, I mentioned the difference that I have in my own portfolio, right? From like very boutique, small niche firms to some more global ones. You then step into a tier above them, which would be like your regional systems integrators that are exceeding a certain level of revenue per year, turnover per year and have quite a big a global presence. And then after that, you have your global system integrators, like your big four, for example. Um, so a potential career path could be that you have more responsibility and are managing much bigger organizations and their relationships with them, graduating to from the team that I'm in to managing maybe two or three partners, but they're much bigger or have much more potential than the portfolio I currently manage. And then maybe managing one account, which is like a big four. So that's a potential growth track. We also have a team at Salesforce for our partner sales. So that also sits within alliances. But rather than being aligned to a particular portfolio of accounts, of partner accounts, they're aligned to our sales teams and they're more industry focused. So they're closer to the trends of a particular industry and its subsectors in the UK. Right. And, and they're sitting on these forecast calls, understanding where our business is headed and then recommending potential partners that could be filling those gaps to help us get those deals over the line. So that could be another path, which is focused on less so partner growth, but more ACV and how we close more business with partners. Apart from that, I think I've now got a network of 23 companies that I look after and I'm plugged into them right. at an exec level. Yeah. For example, like Salesforce went through quite an extensive layoff earlier this year and a lot of alliances folks ended up 
that were impacted ended up going to work for a partner. The client um, side, yeah. In an alliances role. Yeah. So I think yeah. as organizations grow, they think about achieving that growth with their partners. So I think there is lots of opportunity for people that are exploring this space to understand the value that partners can drive and then help that help their organization grow with partners. Yeah. I love that. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about London. So you sure. have now been living in London for so long. Actually. Close to five years. Yeah. Yes. Oh my gosh. So what was it like to, and what is it like to be an expat? Do you consider yourself American still? What is it like to live in London? It was terrible in the beginning, at least. I certainly underestimated what a big life transition it is. I'd never been to London before didn't know anybody here and being from LA I moved here I think in the heart of winter so it was a, a triple whammy and I remember being on the plane from San Francisco to London thinking oh shit like, what have I done <laughs> you know and yeah I landed here and of course had really romanticized it in my head and it's just not how things work you struggle for quite a bit of time and I remember just having to be honest lots of regret in my first week here and being on the phone to my parents and saying, I am definitely coming back in a year. And I think, yeah, found a place to live, was forcing myself to go out and make friends, um, trying to get through winter, not really leaving the house that much though. I think it, maybe six months in, as we started to hit spring, I found a neighborhood that I felt like I could really see myself in. And as the weather got warmer and just accepted that it takes some time, I started to think, okay, I think, this is starting to make sense now and fall a little bit into place. It took a long time for me to stop saying, oh shit, what have I done? And then realize, okay, this was a good move for me. And I think what really made the difference was being able to travel so much. So in London, we get 25 days of PTO. I think that's the minimum. And just, you have Europe at your doorsteps. You could be in a different country in a matter of three hours, which is crazy, but it's very accessible to travel. And Salesforce has offices all over EMEA, which I've taken full advantage of. So I think being able to explore other parts of Europe and being able to do it so often and so easily made a, a huge difference to shifting that mindset of this was a mistake to, oh, this was absolutely the right decision. And I think discomfort is absolutely necessary for personal growth. And I think all the things worth having are on that uh, on the other side of discomfort, yeah. the price you have to pay. Yeah. And I pushed myself literally outside of my comfort zone and really seeing my mindset expand in so many ways by meeting others who think so differently from me and, and then realizing that, wait, different doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. That's been pretty cool. And I feel like I could do anything. I haven't gone through that and, and done it mostly alone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It just gives you a sense of confidence that you can really attain from many other things. And yes. Yeah, it was a very stressful, intense, exhausting first year here. Scary also. Yes. But yeah, no, my parents remind me of that phone call when I said that I would be back in a year and it's been yes. almost five. And, and you're not they're coming like, back. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know, maybe. Yeah. We'll see. Let's talk about but it. So what are far... your five-year plans? What are your five-year plans for your career and your life? I think to have a balanced and happy life. I want to see more of the world, have people that I look up to, that look up to me in my life. I think a big influence on happiness is the quality of a relationship. So continue meeting and, and developing and nurturing relationships, old and new. And now I have a network mostly across Europe and the US, which is pretty cool. And career-wise, I think with some of my partners, they're a really grateful audience, right? And I, within a 30 minute call, I can cover off some things that they didn't know about Salesforce and add tremendous value. I want to know that I'm adding value and helping them solve challenges in the world and then helping them drive their business. Continuing to have that feeling regardless of the role or the company or how much money I'm making of adding positive value. Yeah, that's it. Balance, happiness, not asking for, for much more than that. I love it. Let's switch into a work journal. I know you don't have a work journal, but since you've had such an illustrious career, I would love to ask, what are some things or tips that you do that help you reflect on work and take action? 
I think it's important to set aside time to do exactly that without any interruptions. And you want to think about what's, what do you need to help you have a strong reflection? Because I think we have these biases, like recency bias, right? If I'm doing my reflection (laughs) tomorrow afternoon, tomorrow's Friday, I'm going to think back to all of today, maybe a bit of Wednesday, right? Monday, Tuesday, first half Wednesday, don't really stand a chance. So it's, again, important to realize, like, what should I be looking at to make an accurate analysis and, and remove some of the biases that I think we naturally fall into? Looking at data more. So an exercise that I started doing recently is every two weeks, and this is going to sound so silly because I'm a, I work on against a target and I'm commissionable, but every two weeks I look at my target and I think, where am I against that target? Yeah. And then Wait, I start to think about- Why does that sound about, silly? That sounds perfectly like it makes sense. Because I started doing it only recently. <laughs> like this cadence is, is recent. Before, yeah, before that I would embarrassingly not check the dashboards enough, but now it's, I have that blocker in my diary of I'm going to look at this data and I'm going to track it. So I can see at least on a two week basis, how I'm trending and then, then be able to report back. So yeah, um, setting aside that time to reflect, finding out what you actually need to reflect on and what data you can leverage and then tracking it. So I think that's helped me in the last few months just be able to better speak to the progress that I've made with my partners. And then it sets you up for the next week or the next month, right? If you look at what are the big opportunities, what's closing this quarter, it helps answer the question like what should be top of mind for me rather yeah. than letting my last email or my last conversation sort of drive that and falling into very reactive mode yeah and I think that framework you set up for yourself is less biased as well more structured also it's like yeah. equally past looking and forward looking So I know we're both really good at time management just by the virtue of us both being advisory board members at Girls in Tech San Francisco, which was a job on its own. It's just not, we're not even going to sugarcoat it. We spent so much time in that job as a volunteer. What was it? So we think about, so we were, it was like 26, 15 when we started doing that together. I think I started mm-hmm. first and then you joined very, very shortly after me. Yes. Let's talk about what, why, tell us about that. How did you come to join Girls in Tech? What appealed to you then? And and how did you do it for five, six years? Yeah, you'll, you'll notice the theme um, based on something I said previously. I moved to San Francisco from LA, uh, not being very familiar with the city nor having any friends there. So this all came from me realizing wow, I need to make some friends. And uh, Girls in Tech came across my radar, I think on Facebook. Um, The board was looking for some volunteers to help run a dinner. Um, I volunteered, met with some others, and then got to experience the event as well. And yeah, it was a great way to fill an evening, lots of potential opportunity in terms of just people that you could interact with. And yeah, I had lots of free time. So I kept coming back to, to volunteer and help out as I could. And it's nice to be able to help, and especially for such a great cause. Yeah. And that's how I started getting more and more into girls in tech. And I think maybe a few months of, of doing this and working and, and working with and seeing some of the same people, I got an email from our director, Lauren, saying that someone nominated you to be on the board if you're interested in joining. And I remember thinking when I was, what, 23 at the time and thinking me on the board of something that's so weird, but... Of course, I wasn't going to turn down an opportunity like that to to be even closer to the decision making and drive where the organization was headed and, and have, you know, input into that strategy and direction. So, yeah, I uh, got on the board. I think there were 10 of us at the time. And I was a little bit nervous because it's a very, like, immature thought. I thought this would be dramatic and we've got 10 people who all have their own opinions. So how will we ever make decisions? Yeah. And I think a lot of I think a lot of my views on women and women in the workplace and how we should be engaging were really shattered in a good way through my experience with girls in tech, right? Yeah. And yeah, and I remember everyone being very supportive. Of course, we disagree on some things, but again, I think disagreement is a necessary part of making decisions and, and conducive to having better outcomes, right? 
Yeah, that's, um, true. that's just a part of life. But yeah, and got into that position of running our networking dinners. And it was a full circle moment because I know that we would reach out to the community and say, how can girls in tech help you? What do you need? And, and we were expecting answers like, oh, I want to get this job or I want to get this promotion. And we heard that from time to time, but a lot of the women put up their hands and said, I need more friends. Yeah, just community. Yeah. So and I was true. like, oh my God, that was me. Yeah. Um, so going from that position of having that realization, getting into girls in tech, and then being able to say, okay, how does girls in tech help women make friends, right? And then run the stream of events where the agenda was that there is no agenda, right? You just show up, you have a drink, you have a good time and, and make what you want out of the event. And success is that you walked away with a new connection. Right? So yeah, a very yeah. rewarding experience. And yeah, it, I think a, a good process of being part of something big and, and realizing all the moving parts that go into sort of putting on an event and managing everyone's opinions, expectations, and conflict resolution. And yeah, I think it's a job that I think, or a position that everyone should try experiencing once in a while. I think it's a lot in the perspective. I agree with that fully. I think one of the biggest yeah. things I learned as um, a learning beyond the community that I got and the friendships that I made was how easy it was to put on events, actually. Just if you think about the event, you contact the event, people like the organizers or the venue mm -hmm. and and thinking through you put on one I remember actually because I got my headshot taken there like mm -hmm. what I want to have happen at the event and then thankfully the network had a broad membership base so us selling tickets was usually not yeah. the hard part but I mm -hmm. learned for myself that like actually if you want to get something done it's easier than you think and there are less people in your way than you thought also and there always yeah. a lot of volunteer speakers and volunteers event spaces even that would donate space and so on 100 percent. yeah okay uh, and so we've talked about girls and tech being a great way to make friends and when you moved to london so i know that you made a ton of girls and tech friends in europe tell us more about that yeah i was lucky enough to be um chosen to go on one of our annual retreats that was to Costa Rica in um, 2018. And it was a way of our director's way of thanking me for the work that I'd put in the past year. And there was one person from each of our chapters that attended. And I met uh, quite a few women who were representing our European chapters there. And then later that year, I had decided to make the move to London and I uh, reached out and we did have a chapter in London. So got plugged into a couple of the leaderships um got plugged into a few of the girls that were helping run the london chapter and um, then started flying across europe and then connecting with the others and some of them are my close friends so it's been i think that trip in 2018 i never thought that it would have yielded me so many benefits beyond that trip but i not only yeah. got a network in Europe, some of these girls introduced me to their friends who I call really close friends. And I just saw the ex-MD of the Poland chapter. She's moved to Switzerland. I saw her right. last weekend. I never would have thought back in 2018 that this would be happening off of a, a retreat. Yeah, I feel very lucky and blessed to, to have made so many connections that are very strong today. Yeah, for sure. And that's actually a good... I think takeaway for folks and people, even if you're involved in a community-based organization and you do have events all the time, I would actually encourage everybody to hang out with the people you're on the team with outside of those events, because that's how we got close. I know you were the one who was proactively reaching out to me because I was in a phase of whatever then, dating my boyfriend, not doing very much else. Yeah, because in our org, it just so functioned that Girls in Tech events were put on more individually, you know, you could get help, of course, but we would not necessarily meet to plan the mm -hmm. event together. And so mm -hmm. the way we got close was actually hanging out outside of that and, and just chatting. You and I probably went out. Actually, I don't even remember. Do we, do you remember what exactly we did? I actually, yes, that's right. Cause we were, we got close actually when you moved to London and we just kept in touch also. It, yeah, and it's. I'm very glad that it happened. The timing's a bit of a shame because I think this was maybe three or four months before 
my actual move date and I was putting on a series of networking dinners and I think you were showing up to them consistently to help volunteer and we just got this opportunity and to have this space time and connect on a more personal level right. at these events and you were very kind to offer to take me out to lunch before I moved to London and we had fried chicken across Yelp. I and do not remember this. Yeah. Yeah. We did? Yeah. yeah. I don't remember the place. but Did I pay? Um, yes, you did. Oh yes. my God, thank you. And then <laughs> you showed me around Yelp, which was, yeah, it was very kind. And then I think our friendship really blossomed, ironically, as I moved away. But we just spent two weeks in New York together, which was amazing. Um, so very glad that we kept in touch. Yes, I love that. This was such a fun time. I had so much fun speaking to you and always learning new things about how you think is always really extraordinary. Thank you. Thanks for having me.